All right, guys. Um, so what we wanted to talk about here is filming for a narrative wedding film. This is definitely the meat of the, what we wanted to kind of go over with how we do, do what we do with our wedding films and kind of prepare you and um, make you successful with getting the most out of getting kind of like spoken audio in your wedding films. Just at a show of hands, is anyone here not have any spoken audio in their wedding films? Like music style video. Music style video, you just have music, there's no audio at all. Okay, great, so you all put in audio clips of the day. Does, does, everyone, does anyone here have any problems with you know, acquiring those clips or just like figuring out how to best get the audio for their films? Yeah, so um, th th what this is for is just kind of like getting, making sure you're getting the best spoken audio out of the day that you possibly can. wait for my little thing to catch up. All right, so filming for a narrative wedding video means that you are creating films with story in mind. We want you to be able to go into a wedding prepared to capture great audio and know how to use it in post to create an engaging story in your creative film, which is basically just kind of like saying why, this is why we're going over what we're going over. It should be noted there's no filmmaker out there who is 100% cinematic or 100% narrative. There's generally some balance between the two that speaks to the individual style of the filmmaker. You know, if like this is a scale, we're all somewhere along the scale versus like how cinematic versus how, you know, how much story that we put in it just to kind of like to create our own unique style. Uh, you could choose to be reactive or proactive in a narrative approach, but if you want to have better success in, telling, in storytelling, you need to be proactive. Great narrative films don't happen by accident. And I'm gonna, uh, we're going to go over exactly how you can be proactive with getting uh, the best audio that you can over your wedding day. So it's just kind of like telling you that success means that you're doing stuff in advance. You're not just being purely reactive to what's happening on a wedding day. So we want to get you in the mindset of preparing for certain elements throughout the day that's going to, um, it's going to set you up the best. All right, the different elements that can make for a successful narrative film. The technical, having the right gear is essential in creating good narrative work. Um, Sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> okay, turn me off. Uh, personal audio recorders. Recording off of a PA system. Microphones, rehearsal dinner setups. Um, you know, we kind of went over the gear before, but what this is saying is we want you to be able to have the right gear because, you know, just, you know, if you were to just go in with a shotgun microphone on your camera trying to get good audio, it's not going to work. And I know you all know that, and, but what the, the point we're trying to drill into is about having the right audio equipment that's going to give you the best, cleanest recording that you can possibly get, so that way it's not distracting in your films that w when you're dropping these audio pieces in. All right. We email all of our clients tips for maximizing their experience with us. They contain tips for what we are looking for in a story, tips that relate to good audio are have parents, maid of honor, and again, you will receive all these in form later, so you don't have to write them down. Um, have, by, by tips, this is just a questionnaire that we send to everyone through our, um, seven, we use 17 hats, and so we send this out to all of our clients to let them know that, hey, if you want a wedding film like the wedding films you, you've seen and fallen in love, in love with, these are tips and how you can, things that you can do to help, help with that. Have parents, maid of honor, best man, write out a well thought out toast. Ask them to include a memory of the couple in their early dating stages or how they met. We had a toaster this past weekend who, um, I mean, basically she just walked up to the microphone and congratulated the couple. She did not read her tips. But, um, <laughs> you know, we, we want to make sure, and I know this sounds self-explanatory, you, you wouldn't think that you have to say this, but so many people go out there and wing it. And you can, uh, some people can get away with winging it and some people can't. We all have seen the people who can, or, or the, we've seen the people who can't get away with it. Being, uh, having, having the couple tell their toasters to be intentional, have things written out, or at least bullet points, is going to make for a more successful thing. Uh, you know, especially um, the dating stages and how they met. We've just had so many uh, toasters who just get up onto the microphone and just start roasting the groom or something like that. And, you know, it doesn't really make for, doesn't make for a good film. So we're just trying to prep them and to, uh, to, to do this right. Tell your fish in a few stories about your relationship up until now and ask him or her to include snippets of some of your stories during the ceremony. Um, having the efficient know part of your story is, um, is really great. You know, uh, sometimes when you have um, 
more of like the mass weddings where the officiant is just kind of like the person who's traveling and they don't really have a personal relationship. You're not really going to get this. But for those who do have the personal relationship with their officiant, um, having these snippets of audio just are really go a long way with having that story that's going to be great for the film. So we're going to go over pre-production. Um, write a letter to your bride or groom in the morning of your wedding day and read what these you wrote. These are still the tips. That was still the tips. That, that, that. Write a letter to your bridegroom the morning of your wedding day and read what you wrote to the camera. Have them bring in their own stationery and pens so they aren't, willing, uh, aren't writing a love letter on the back of a napkin with a big pen. <laughs> I mean, I, I try to make that sound funny, but you know, it's like if they, if they want to write a letter, you know, make sure that they just bring good stationery and an attractive looking pen because nothing will kill the mood more than we're just, when they're just finding scrap paper and whatever pen they can find. You, you know, they could be dressed in a tux, it could be like in a you know beautiful scenario, but you know if they're writing with a cheap little pen on a scrap of paper, it's just going to kill the mood in the video. Do you find that them writing like they creates like a different element as opposed to like telling them to write it in advance, like the week of the wedding? Or? So it can definitely be beforehand. We had one bride once; she wrote it all from scratch that morning of, and it was two pages. And the planner was like, and I'm like, I did not know it was going to be this long. And so um, we, it's not that important that they actually write it that morning. We can do a lot of fake writing um, and just tracing, and you can still see the hand. Um, or we could just have them fake the very end where they say love, so and so, and then we see that actual writing. So. But even more so, they don't have to write it from scratch. They can have it pre-written. And so you can tell them pre-write it on another piece of paper, then bring in another piece of paper to then transcribe it. If you have time and if it's a short letter, they can write out the entire thing. Like she was saying, sometimes we do have the really long ones. And what I'll do is, you know, for the, gro you know, for the groom, because you know, usually if I'm uh, recording him doing a letter, I'll have him start off the letter, and then, you know, where you could say the, like, dear or whatever, then the rest of my shots will just be from far away of him just writing. And then what I'll have him do is I'll have him trace out the signature, or, like, let's say he has the signature already, and, but uh, what I'll have them do is I'll have them trace out the end of the signature, then immediately put like a new like squiggly line underneath <laughs> just to show him write something. I didn't know that. <laughs> because then, then, it, then it, it feels like he, it's, it, it's, it feels authentic. But yeah, yes, yeah, so you don't want them to just write like a five page letter from scratch. Um, yeah. Yeah, pre writing is a good idea. Pre writing is a great idea. Have them share their story with you. Um, okay. Um, yeah, have them share their story with you if you, if you know their story. You will know to look for or find that's significant on their wedding day. And by that we mean engage with your couples ahead of the, ahead of the wedding day. You know, have a Skype meeting, FaceTime, uh, phone call, TikTok. I don't know, is that, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I just like to keep throwing it out there. Engage with your, uh, with your couples ahead of, the wedding, uh, ahead of the day. Don't do it two days before. Don't do it a week before. You don't want to do it anywhere uh, sooner than a month before the wedding. <coughs> Because after, you know, once it's closer to a month, uh, once it's like less than a month, they're going to be focused on the wedding. Get them a little bit further out. Hear their story. Hear their love story. How they fell in love. All these different elements. Because you're, you'd be amazed what you can pick up from that that you'll find during the actual wedding day that it's going to help you um, look for things to kind of tell that story a little bit better. Think of ways to engage your groomsmen and bridesmaids during preparations that result in people talking to each other and not just glued to their phones or football games, should have put that on there as well. I mean, it, this is hard, like one of the things that I do with the guys is I say, hey guys, um, let's just do a group shot together. By shot, I mean literal shot, you know, and then the guys can get around that. Turn off the TV, have them do a shot, you know, they'll toast to the camera, say something nice about the groom. Uh, what do you do for the girls to kind of help them engage? I don't really need to, I mean, they're, for the photos, they're already, <laughs> they're already kind of into it, yeah. Uh, any, any guys from in Georgia, <laughs> guys who are just like glued to the football game, literally, they're not, they're not talking, they literally don't talk, they're just all sitting on the couch with their Bud Light, and uh, so it, it's hard sometimes, but that's why the shot with the guys works the best. Um, turn down off the music, we were talking about this before, during preparation so you can hear the natural audio. Um, we were kind of talking about this prior to this, we find different we're looking for certain times of the, of, of the um, preparations to do this. We, we try not to do it for the entire thing because we don't want to just kill the vibe 
of the whole preparations. We don't want to just tell them, you know, no background audio at all, and it just becomes quiet and weird. But definitely during times that you, you know we're going to produce good audio, such as, you know, for the guys, like if they're going to do like a nice shot or a toast or something like that, you know, I'll do it when like if, if the groom's father is going to help him out, put his jacket on, I want to hear any audio that's happening. With the girls, I mean, you'll know. I mean, I don't think it's as much of a problem with the girls turning down the audio. Yeah, I mean, as soon as she puts on the dress, it's down. So, yeah. Um, send a questionnaire at booking. Ask questions highlighting their backstory. How did they meet? How did they propose? You know, if booking is a year before their wedding, this starts um, just having a questionnaire at the time of booking. Helps you start getting some of the information about them. And then you can use that information to kind of dig more into their story when you talk to them like a month before their wedding. Um, schedule a call or meet up. Uh, we just talked about that before. If the couple is interested in doing these elements, it's important to make sure that there's adequate time on the schedule to make them happen. You know, because we, we have some couples who are really gung ho about doing the letters, and so we just need to make sure that their planner knows this, so that way that there's enough time during preparations to make it happen. You know, usually with the girls, they're in a, um, for letter writing, they're in their robes. Guys, I want to be fully dressed up. I don't have, you know, guys in their robes or <laughs> their boxers or whatever. It just doesn't look as doesn't look as classy. But so, but that presents a challenge because, you know, girls, you, you uh, with the bride, you want it to do it before she puts on her dress, um, and the guys you want it to do after he's dressed. So it's kind of different point in the, in the timeline. So you're just kind of coordinating that, that, making sure you have enough time. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Mm -hmm. You're saying if, if we're doing the letters? Um, we could fake it as a little as five minutes. Just for letter writing, is that what we're talking about? Like, let's say they're like, oh, what time do you think you should start? Okay. And you say an hour and a half before you write the lead for your first letter. Okay, a lot of times we base it off hair and makeup, so I only need like the last 10 minutes of her being completely ready. Because you don't want her with no makeup and her hair not done. Like, honestly, if we just get a little bit of brush, or blush, 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 <laughs> and lipstick, you know, and a lot of times I'll have the makeup artist fake it. If we show up after makeup and she's still there, we'll just go to the window and just do a few Were you stuff. asking specifically about the, uh, about the written audio portion? Well, I guess, because, like, so if someone is asking me how much time do you need, like, I, so for example, to like, do this. Like, if I, if I get a, um, a timeline and it shows that I have 45 minutes like I get there 45 minutes before they leave. Oh, okay. I know I have to say like, that's not gonna work. You want to read a card to end, you want to do a rope shot, and you want to go up the time. Like, do you guys sort of have that cut off where you say that half an hour is not enough to do a car reading, get dressed? And, like, what do you I mean, I think it is enough time. For, I think 45 minutes would be enough time oh. for all that. Um, if you if you show up 45 minutes before they leave, she's probably already done with hair and makeup, and they're probably ready to get dressed. And honestly, when the bridesmaids go get dressed, or they're waiting for mom to get dressed, I have the bride here standing around doing nothing. Like, hey, let's do your letter right now. So a lot of times she's in her robe while she's writing, because really other people are getting ready before she gets in her dress. So there's usually like downtime like that. And the guys the same way, they, they get dressed in two minutes, then they're just kind of bored. Pull the groom away, and she just literally one minute is all I need of him writing. Then uh, for actually getting the audio, which we haven't covered yet, it's a little more complicated, but usually I kick everyone out, but then it just takes like a minute or two. So I mean, for me, the entire process is less than five minutes. Sometimes, sometimes it's a little bit longer, but five minutes is all I need to be able to carve all this out. And of course, kind of need the photographer not to be in the way. But it, it also, like if you, one second, if you know that you're gonna try to make it happen, you can start lining your ducks up in a row, working on logistics, like finding a place that you wanna do it, making sure the light is good, you know, clearing the table, getting everything ready, so that way when that five minutes is here, mm -hmm. you can just kind of move right into that instead of having to try to work all those logistics out later. Mm -hmm. Do you find that most of your couples want to do the lettering out loud or just to get I get most of them to do, I get most of the couples to read the, the letter out loud. Um, like they want to. I guess so, yeah. Most, a lot, most girls are for it. I, I get some guys who are not. And my, my reasoning is, is I tell the guys, I said, look, let's get it now. You can tell me later you absolutely don't want it in the film. But I can't come back later and record it. You know, so let's just record it now, and you can tell me later not to use it. I've only had a couple times where they've said, I really don't want it in the film. 
So it, it, by by doing that, you're just you're, you're still getting it done, and they probably don't care after that. And then, <clears throat> is that what you meant, just about like? Yeah, that, like so we, we give them options. Like, do you want to read it out loud? Do you want to just like you have a visual? You read it. And some people are like, mm -hmm. I don't want to read it. This is perfect. You know, like, mm -hmm. We want it to be like personal, mm -hmm. or it's not something I would read out loud. Mm -hmm. So you know, we just kind of vary it based on the kind of people we have a different ways to approach learning. And we basically just say, here's the options. What do you like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the, if they're really adamant about not reading out loud, sometimes you can say to them, well, is there a segment you don't want to read out loud? Because then maybe you can read the rest. You know, maybe you could just do the opener, say a quick little couple things, and maybe there's a little bit that you don't want to include, and we just cut that out. You know, don't read that part, but then finish up the letter. And then there should be some usable audio mm -hmm. somewhere in there. I, that happens periodically, and you might not even know. You know, that happens with the girls, too. Okay. Especially if it's a long one, it's too long to read. They'll just read a couple segments. Um, but the way we do letter readings, though, is we want them to read the letter for the first time to themselves. We want them to not be aware of the camera. We want them to really just focus on the words that are written. If you have them read it out loud, the first time they read it, they're focusing on reading it, and they might not be able to like really take in the emotions. So the first time the photographer and us are in there, or whatever, I'm in there by myself usually with the bride, but um, they'll get the real reaction. Um, when she's reading it to herself, she'll tear up. The photographer's happy that she got the real reaction. Then she can leave when I say, okay, now can you read it to the camera? So the photographer already got what she needed. The bride already read it once, had that emotional response that she wanted, and now the next one, the next reading is just the logistic of reading it for the film. So, yeah. Little tip, if you are capturing them reading it out loud or reading it to themselves for the first time, always let the camera roll longer than you think. So many times you're just looking at the letter, then that, that emotion that is just like on the cusp will eventually come out. And, so, and there's been multiple times I've learned that, you know, you just keep letting it roll because you'll just be staring at the letter and all of a sudden like five seconds later, then, then they're wiping away the tear. So um, just wanted to throw that out there as a little trick did or hack. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. <clears throat> and I, if this is something I'm going to address later on, and maybe not the sales part of it, then great. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, one thing that I struggle with is trying to, um, you know, when, when I first started out, especially like a lot of the ways I go up to stuff, like half of them wanted to do the story thing, and then half of them, you know, wanted to have a real traditional wedding, and now I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm trying to like qualify the people that I'm working with, and like, okay, only trying to only work with people who want to do the style that I want to do, if that makes sense. But I'm trying to figure out how do I, how do I figure that out before I, before I book them and not end up with brides and grooms that are like, oh, well, we're not doing the first look. Okay, well, are you, is your officiant saying anything special? No, it's just a traditional message. Well, can we get rehearsal dinner or stuff? No, we really don't want that. Oh, are y'all doing letters? But no, no mm -hmm. letters. And it's like, you're wondering what content there and, is. And, and I, and I've gotten a few more of those than I'd like to, like you maybe think that those weren't as common, but I guess in South Louisiana, especially in the Northern area, there's a lot of people doing the Catholic mm -hmm. ceremonies and stuff, and those types of weddings can a lot of times tend to be really traditional, <coughs> so I guess sometimes, and, and I've also had a few where they're like, okay, well we'll do letters, that, that, sounds, that sounds good, and then I get to a month before the wedding, and they're like, uh, actually, you know, I talked to the talk to the groom, really where he really just doesn't want to give them. And so I'll talk to them about how to push back and stuff, and then they, they won't budge on that. So. I mean, just about pre qualifying the client. I mean, if you're trying, if you're making sure that you have food on the table, it's like, I don't, I don't really know if you can really be in a position to, I, I, we are not in a position where I, we turn down clients just for like um, creative, creative reasons like that. Yeah. But I think what it comes down to is kind of like when it comes down to, uh, we were talking about branding and you know, just having the types of films that you want people to fall in love with as the foremost of what people see of you. So that way in hoping that you're attracting the right type of client. And that, that's, that's part of what that whole section of branding was mostly about, about attracting the right type of client. So if you're having films that are incorporating those elements like the letter reading, the vows, you know, even having the guys reading the letters, you know, just put that on the, for, the, for, uh, the forefront of your website and hoping that, you know, people fall in love with those films and that's what they want. 
yeah, I don't like try to like like find that out on a phone call and, and turn people down. No, I mean we had one wedding last year where they just told us that we didn't want to like no audio. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean it was January wedding. I'm like, all right, sure. But um, you know, it's just like I, I would say the goal in the business. If, if the, the, the balance between appeasing the creative side, appeasing the business side, is you know making sure your branding speaks to the type of films you want, so that the way the majority of the work that you're getting is going to be on point with what you want to be doing. And then when the occasional stuff happens, it's not on point. You just kind of get through it. It's a paycheck. Um, but in, in, and if you're finding that most of the work that you're doing is more about a paycheck than about being creatively inspired then maybe your branding isn't on point and maybe you're not attracting the right type of client. I have a question to come back, Kate. It's what you said about having them read the letter and try to read the letter by herself mm -hmm. first. You're talking, this is the letter that she is writing to her, uh, to the group? So it could go either way. It could be either, so if she, if she wrote it, she doesn't need that quiet moment to read to herself. She can just read what she wrote to the camera. When we have her read it to herself, that's from the groom. Okay, so you guys are filming both, because before you're talking about her filming her actually writing the yeah. letter herself. Yeah. And then when you film her reading the letter she just wrote. So, okay, so if we film the writing, which is less, has been less common lately, um, if we film the writing, then we want to hear what she just wrote for the edits that makes sense. Um, so I feel like though a lot of times uh, we don't get the writing in and, um, and so having them read the other letter is like totally fine. Like it makes sense in the edit. Just make so. sure you're consistent with, you know, don't Knowing. have the same person re read both letters because then it gets confusing. Like her own letter and then her. And to be careful letter. what you're showing on at audio because if you're showing the wrong things while the wrong people are reading it, then it can be confusing for the mm -hmm. viewer. But sometimes logistics wise, uh, it's not possible to always have the same person reading it, the same person writing it. Sometimes because of the day, how the day goes, you just, it just, you just have to kind of reverse it. And we'll be texting each other during preparations, notifying us anything from like, hey, uh, there's a package on route, uh, be prepared for it. Because you know, we want to be able to kind of get that shot of the person coming in, handing off a package with the letter and the stuff present. like that. The present package, <laughs> present. And you know, we're, we'll also be communicating back and forth and saying like, hey, just film the groom writing his letter just to let you know so she can try to do the same and match her content with what I'm doing. I forgot to do that last Saturday. So I filmed her writing and forgot to tell him so he didn't get a Thanks for the heads up, complimentary okay. shot. But it's okay. Well, we'll do, we'll do another workshop working with your spouse. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, one wedding a few months ago and uh, I had a groom and the uh, bride next to each other by the door. They were and they were, what, uh, what we did is um, we switched the letters. Mm -hmm. So uh, the woman read her letter and, and the bride read his letter. Is that okay to do that too? Or? Yeah, I find that trickier for the edit. Do, do they read it out loud for the camera at, one at a time? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's fine. That's just a different way of doing it. Uh, yeah. I thought I was confused. I was trying to make it like separately. I think what's important though for that, um, and we have not touched upon that, is sequencing and making sure that your shots that you're getting are supporting kind of like this story. Do you want to touch upon the sequencing, like what you would do and how you would sequence those shots? Well, I don't know about specifically that scene. Well, what, what I was thinking in my mind is you want to get the wide shot showing them next to each other. Are you talking about like a first touch where they're not seeing each other? Mm -hmm. So I would make sure to get a wide shot showing, you know, the, the, the couple, the scene. You want to yeah. see what's happening. And then when the, like if the bride is reading the letter, you want, um, you want to show like kind of a tighter shot of the bride reading the letter. And maybe just as a supporting shot, you can try to get over her shoulder to see what she's seeing. Maybe you could get a shot of just them holding hands together, you know, just like those supporting shots to kind of help, uh, cinematically what you're seeing, uh, what you're hearing in the story. Mm -hmm. A lot of those shots that would be after her real reading. I don't want it to disrupt her real reading. But if you have two shooters, I mean, generally one of, uh, one of us is, we're getting different things, but. It depends. I don't like interrupting real moments. 
Oh, well, we don't interrupt it if we're just uh, filming. You're saying getting things. over her shoulder. Well, okay, that would, that, that would be that would be um, <laughs> that would be after the fact. But just kind of like while it's actually happening, one person stay safe on just a person reading it, and then the other person getting complimenting shots. Do you all ask will their readings ever be included on the schedule? No. On the schedule? So much of what we do is just trying to find pockets of time. I, I find it's, it doesn't really work out to try to get them to put it on the schedule. They have, the couple has to be a real advocate for wanting it on the schedule, or it, ha they have to be, it has to be really important for them for it to be, end up on the schedule. Um, I actually don't like it on the schedule because if there was a good time for it to happen, but it's not time for it yet on the schedule, when we get to it, oh, we don't. We ran out of time. We got to cut it, which actually happened to us. When it was on the schedule, they cut it because mm. we were running late. But there would, I mean, there's always a pocket of time before she puts on her dress. There's just we're waiting around. People are getting dressed, and so that's just where we kind of get in there and do it. Has anyone ever heard from the planner? Hey guys, we don't have time for this. We're going to do it later. How how often has it ever happened later? <laughs> Never. Does it, if it does not happen, then it will not happen. Trust me, I've done this so long. I don't think it's ever once been able to happen later. First of all, I always make it important to know beforehand and talk to the couples. Like, is this important to you? Because if it is, you need to think about it when you're thinking about your timeline. Because mm -hmm. people require an extra confidence. Mm -hmm. Having it on the schedule doesn't mean we're married to doing it at 3 o'clock or whatever. Mm -hmm. It just means people know it's something that's going to happen in the beginning of mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of times we're still finding like the ideal exact time. But okay. people know, the planner knows it's part of it. The mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely a good idea to reach out to the pl or I, I think it, so I do you reach out directly to the planner or do you have the client tell the planner that? It depends on the relationship they have because there's everything from a full service planner to the day of mm -hmm. So, but I usually know like if the couple's like, you're talking to us up to the right day and then some planners are like, you're talking to me, they're heading off. So it's just kind of smart. It would carry so much more weight if the client asked the planner for those five minutes or whatever. We always ask the couple, planner, whatever the relationship is, is now, the email goes to the couple saying, hey, are you doing letters? Is this important to you? If so, here's our suggestion of how we can capture it. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. I mean, the more you can get. super important to know beforehand so we can be prepared. The more you can get stuff like that baked into the schedule, I mean, the easier your life will probably be. Mm -hmm. All right, let me keep going. And remember, all that was happening in pre-production before the wedding date. All right, the different elements that can make for a successful narrative film. Production, meaning at the actual time of I the shooting. I think that's what we were just talking about. No, we were on pre-production. We're on no, production now. But that's what we were just talking about just now. Writing letters. Writing letters, sorry. <laughs> so we jumped ahead. Uh, for the cinematic element of this, make sure that the scene looks nice. Bring them into good light. Get multiple angles. I mean, we're not photojournalistic. Has anyone ever worked with photojournalistic photographers? They will not do anything on the scene. They will not change anything. Uh, we're not photojournalistic. If there's like the Sani water bottles sitting on the scene, we would remove them. Um, I love just like finding a nice little table, uh, bringing the groom over to the window so nice light comes in. I'm a fan of dramatic lighting and just sitting him next to it, filming him, multiple angles, writing it out. Um, Kay does something similar, similar with the girls. She has, even has a picture she's going to show later, which mm -hmm. shows uh, a bride writing out her letter and showing how she set the scene to get that good light. Do you guys ever open up your external lights or your for the types of stuff? I try not to, unless there's no available light, like window light. Yeah. Most of the time, there's available light. I mean, how awful would it be if you had bride prep in like this room? <laughs> I mean, we've all had. Well, we have. We've we had have stuff like that. had stuff like that. And but then honestly, we just take them out to a window. Take them out to a window. Take the groom. I mean, even if it just means like staging three or four shots, I'd rather have three or four fake stage shots next to beautiful natural light than getting an authentic moment that's happening in terrible light. I remember one of the first weddings I did. It's like introductory to weddings, and like the groom literally got dressed in the bathroom. <laughs> I remember filming it and. Wish I could have gone back and, you know, <laughs> knew to uh, bring him in good light, but this you is don't... Probably, this is probably the cinematic portion. Okay, right, right, right. right. <laughs>
We'll cover stuff like this. It looks best if guys are fully dressed and the girls are in a robe with their hair and makeup already done. Keynote, hair and makeup already done. Please do not film the bride or any girls without <laughs> hair and makeup. Mom, or the mother of the bride, mother of the groom. Or make, no, it won't make the highlight or the cinematic. Now, well, film. if it does make the highlight, you will be getting an email or a phone <laughs> call. So just whatever you do, don't do that. Okay, reading the letters, bring them to a quiet place to do, to do the reading. Seems self-explanatory. The video of them reading their letters can also be important, so make sure your shot is good enough to use for the film. There's a few times when I just like had the video just for syncing, I don't know why. But we, oh, yeah, we yeah, always yeah. try now to make sure that the video of them reading, um, whether they're visible, audibly reading it or just you know visually reading it, uh, just always have them in good light. Are you, uh, are you using a lab? Really yes. Yeah. Yep. We just upgraded our second lav. We had upgraded one before. Um, so guys, it's always easy enough to put a lav on them for the reading. For the girls, we, uh, one of the hacks that we do, um, I don't know who came up with it, but basically if there's, a, if there's a letter, you can put the lav inside the card. Like clip it to the bottom. Clip it to the bottom and have her read it. So the shot, you're not seeing the lav at all because oftentimes it's maybe a low cut dress and there's no place to put that lav. Or the robe like kind of But falls. if you put it in the card, it's actually catching all that audio and um, making for really good recording. Oh, we always use a lav, definitely. I mean, shotguns just aren't good enough. Though Rode has put out a new shotgun that looks really good. Anyone see it? Yeah. The NTG uh, shotgun microphone. For the uh, for on camera, I really want to rent it out and try it out because it looks really good. Still would love them though. All right, uh, it's important to get good at recording on the first take. Don't interrupt the flow. If there's going to be a strong emotional reaction, it will happen then. Tip: Leave your camera rolling for five to ten seconds. We talked about that, but <clears throat> again, don't interrupt. If, if if like the groom is reading the letter out loud for the first time, and I'm sorry if um. No matter what, for the first time, if he's reading someone else's, if he's reading the other person's letter, you never want to interrupt that. Let the whole thing go, no matter what. Just, if it's bad light, find good light, because the, the real emotional reactions always happen the first time. Sometimes he's reading, like, let, let's say he's reading her letter out loud, and this is for audio. Try not to micromanage how he's reading it. Let him, let him get through it, because the, there'll always be the strongest emotional reaction on the first take. You know, sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear the groom pause, and you're like, hey, what's going on? You don't realize that he's completely choked up, trying his hardest not to cry on the camera. So you want to let, just let those moments happen un, uh, naturally. A lot of times, um, if, if, if he messes up certain points, I'll have him go back to it and just reread a couple sentences, just to make sure we have continuity, and just to make sure that, that those, if he makes any big verbal gaffes, we can kind of correct that. But we're all about natural reactions. We, 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 whatever we do, we try not to interrupt natural reactions because that's going to be the gold. You know, especially when we're talking about like the snippets that we we're talking about earlier on today. The snippets, like if you're creating social media snippets, if you get a shot of the groom reading the letter, the next thing you know, his head is buried in his hands and he's crying. I mean, like, that's YouTube gold right there. That's like 14 million hits in, <laughs> you know, we. Crying grooms is the most searchable <laughs> thing. You know, some, some wedding videographers, if you follow their YouTube channels, I swear, like, every other title on their YouTube videos is groom cries, <laughs> strong groom emotional reaction, you know, just like father cries, or mm -hmm. it's always about the guy crying, never about the girl. <laughs> Have them read it again if you feel that the first reading was pretty sloppy. Also, feel free to get sequencing shots like them opening the letter at different angles, etc. Do this after the initial reading. For example, if I, you know, first I'll ask the groom to uh, kind of like read the letter out loud, and then you know because when when he was actually reading it for the first time, like not out loud, but you know just for his initial reaction from it, you're, you're just I'm just getting one shot when he's reading it for the first time. I'm on his face. I'm not thinking about alternate shots or different angles because the gold is I want to see an emotional reaction from him. So I keep it just on his face the entire time. After he's read it, then I'll go and get different angles, you know, maybe over his shoulder as he's pulling the card out of the envelope, then maybe from across the room, just showing him reading it by himself. Same with the girls. It's just, um, 
think of those sequencing shots after the event has actually occurred. And we haven't really gone over sequencing yet. Uh, we're a little ahead of that, but sequ sequencing is just the thought of the, it's the um, being able to think about having multiple shots in a row that kind of like, um, what would you say is a better definition? Um, it's probably in one of our slides. Okay, we'll get, we'll get the sequencing. <laughs> it's just multiple shots that are going to tell like a quick, that build story. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about the ceremony. And again, we're still on narrative audio and getting the best audio from your wedding film. And this is all about acquisition, by the way. This is not about editing. She's going to talk about editing tomorrow and how to use these sound bites. This is just about acquiring the sound bites to make sure that you have what you need for the edit. Our approach is to put a deer tent in both the officiant and groom. Groom's mic will pick up ballast in the bride 99% of the time. Many people put a mic on the bride with success. Um, if you got, it, it, um, that pretty much covers that. Obviously, if you have two grooms, then you could mic them both independently. It's just so easy with a groom with a jacket to put a mic mm -hmm. on. It's just dresses are a lot more complicated. Some people have success putting a white DR10 um, with special straps or stuff like that on on one of the on the bride um, it's difficult it's definitely something we have not had to do extensively some with some type of dresses you can hide uh, a microphone do you want to talk about yeah so we, we've really only mic'd one bride I think during the ceremony she had like very structured corset and I literally just shoved it in her dress okay and you couldn't see anything so and I clipped it to like the inner part of her dress. She was totally fine with it. You know, I got her permission. She wanted that. It helps having <laughs> my wife with me. It'd be so <laughs> awkward if it was me trying to Again, do that. have a bridesmaid help you. You know, I think that's a great have tip. Have a bridesmaid help you. <laughs> if you're a guy. Um, but then, actually, the, the film that you guys will watch me edit tomorrow that I've already pre-recorded made shorter for you guys. Um, we didn't mic her for the actual ceremony. She has a real lacy, slinky dress. Like, you can't really hide it. So I feel like that's more popular of a dress these days. And so I didn't even try to mic that for the ceremony. But they did a first touch for that wedding. And they prayed. And she prayed and he prayed. So I wanted to get her audio. Um, so f for that, I did mic her with a white lapel. And we, it's actually funny, she had double-sided tape. And I'm like, we need to carry around double-sided tape. She had double-sided tape to help her, her lace stick to herself. So I actually kind of uh, just taped it into the back. And you could see the pack from the back, which is why we wouldn't do that during the ceremony. But for the first touch, it was totally fine because we're seeing just the front of her. Um, and we got really incredible audio. And it was really that. important for that first touch because normally we talk about how the bride will be picked up by the groom. But because they were kind of around, they were the, around corner, the corner, so that's um, not the work. audio would not have been yeah. picked up. Yeah. And I would argue that for a moment like that, it's better to have good audio than it is to have good visual elements. So even if we didn't have that white lapel, if all we had was a black, personally, I'd rather have her. a black lapel to get good audio because that's more gold than just the visual element of them doing that. Because what they said was really good. Yeah. yeah. For what she said. So it's just all about you know making sure that using whatever tools you have to get the good audio. You don't have to have the white microphone. It helps. Um, we have the white pack too. We have the white pack. Yeah. Uh, have backup audio if possible. Plug in an alternate source when a source is available. Do Do you guys feel okay about ceremony audio? Does, does anyone here struggle with ceremony audio? I was just only when like there's like multiple podiums on each side. But well, let me ask you a question. Is that important for the doc edit or the, or the, the creative edit? Uh, yeah, you can get mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times they're on the PA, so even just having a good shotgun is going to pick them up. It, but it, it's, part, it's, it's stuff like that, which is why, like, even with the mindset of, you know, figuring out, you know, are you, are you doing things, driving yourself crazy, figuring out how to get the perfect doc edit when people don't even really care? Now, usually what I'll do if there's a lectern, like a, uh, like a mass, and sometimes they'll be up at the front, I'll do a lot of the talking up there, guest speakers or whatnot. I'll put a DR40 down there, and then I'll get the audio like a lot better than just picking it up off the shotgun, off the PA. But I don't kill myself over it. I'm, I'm just really focused on the, the creative edit. Anything I can get good with the doc edit from them, I don't want to say minimal effort, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to do anything that's going to sacrifice a creative edit anymore. And that means that I do best effort real quick. And if it works, great. If not, 
as long as the creative edit is good. I mean, I literally, I mean, has, does anyone here have anyone who complains about the doc edits, maybe that they're not perfect? They care about the creative edits. Yeah, they're, uh, they want, they, you know, of course I want them to want that, so I get more money, but they don't even, no right? No. <laughs> right. No, right. seriously, they give it to the they give it to the parents, it, it, and that's why it's, it's part of that's why I wanted to bring up that whole thing before because like, you know, th th there might be areas in each one of uh, as a couple of you guys came in late, you missed the whole part where we talked about like the documentary versus the cinema cinematography portion where just getting in a mindset of you know like if, if you're all about if the creative edit is your number one seller. Don't do things for the doc edit that's going to take away from the creative. Focus on the creative edit, and doc edit is stuff that's just best effort. Set it and forget it. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, you're not going to hear about it. Um, so that's why, you know, the ceremony audio, really the only thing that's important about the ceremony audio for your creative edit is just going to be what's on the efficient or it's going to be the vowels. And just having a good lav on that into a little pocket recorder it's going to work 99% of the time, and that's going to cover your needs 99% of the time. And even when I have backup audio, the backup audio sounds terrible, and it's just like, I don't even know why I struggled backup audio, because we, she probably won't even I don't use even it. listen to it. But, but <laughs> if the primary audio failed... Well, then if it failed, then I would. I'll search for something. But uh, more often than not, the, ba the backup audio doesn't even sound that good because you're running through other people's PA systems and it's not clean. Yeah. The DR10s are great. I mean, the mic screws in. Before we had where they could just pop out, it was super risky. But they're super reliable now that it screws in. So Yeah, it is, it's a great day to be doing this type of stuff with this DR10s. Have an additional mic and recorder for the times there are two efficients. That's why we have three DR10s. That's the original reason why we got a third one, is because I think we even had a wedding this year where there were like three efficients, and we're just like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and you know, you get the primary two, but a lot of times when you have certain uh, ceremonies where maybe um, there's multicultural, like we've had some Hindu slash Jewish weddings, we've had like Muslim slash Hindu weddings, we've had some uh, some other weddings where uh, maybe uh, they're doing it in. Um, Arabic, but then they have an English translation. Um, having, you know, th th these are great things to be able to figure out ahead of time uh, because then you need to have two body packs for the efficients and then one on, on uh, your groom. But really the second efficient who's, well, I guess it can go both ways because, you know, having the native language with subtitles can be a great feel and can really kind of like give you a different feel for your films that you're used to having. So you might want to go for the original translation or the original language with subtitles versus the translation. Mm -hmm. But having that will give you the option to um, be able to capture all those. I have a question about the DR10. Do you use uh, rechargeable battery yes. yeah. in the DR10? Yeah. Yeah. I have a problem with the readout on those. What's I use rechargeable batteries. I use NLU Pros, the blacks. Uh -huh. And I, re I replace the AAAs every year because it feels like they start losing their char their maximum charge about after about a year. Even when you even when I change it to the appropriate um, it still does it reads it as two out of three bars or three out of four bars, whatever it is. Never shows as full. The only time I will ever uh, make an adjustment is if we're doing a ceremony that's longer than an hour and a half, I'll probably put in a real battery. Like we've had some ceremonies that are three hours long and I think I've put in lithiums just to make sure that we last that long. But for any ceremony that's an hour and a half and shorter, those uh, rechargeable and loop blacks will always work. I was really nervous when I moved to rechargeable batteries because um, I used to use always, you know, I don't even know how we survived because we would just have double A's in some of our equipment and we just, every once in a while I'll be like, how long have these been in here for? <laughs> I don't know how we didn't m miss more stuff earlier on in the days, but rechargeables are great. But also have other ones for when A, you forget to recharge your batteries, and B, if you're gonna have, if you find out like, oh man, it's a three hour ceremony, how did I miss this? You need to make sure it's gonna last that long. All right, uh, let's talk about the toast. Um, a mic stand, we talked about this, is great at keeping the toast giver stationary. I'm going to invent a way to uh, glue the bike to the stand. 
<laughs> and I will be very rich when I come out with that because all of you will buy it. <laughs> uh, so that way they don't, they don't just take the mic off the stand. I mean, we can threaten them with whatever we want to threaten them with. If they're drunk enough, they don't care. They're just going to walk off with it. But just, yeah. See, it just looks bad, though. <laughs> still, I mean, it's just... And then, and then just, it's, yeah. <laughs> and then they're gonna drop <laughs> it. Then. Have you had anybody drop the mic? No. If I did, the uh, client would be getting a bill, which I would hope they would pass along to the person <laughs> who dropped the mic. Because the thing is, if honestly, if that did happen, I would have um, I would have difficulty with thinking that the the mic was good. You know, there's certain things like I mean, I do not loan out gear to anyone. Because the thing, I, I don't want to risk someone borrowing gear, dropping it, not telling me. Then, you know, next thing I know, it fails during the wedding. So if, if that mic was damaged, and I don't, but, and get this, let's say we do three weddings before we start editing. Then we notice for three weddings worth, we have bad audio. I would replace that mic in a heartbeat. <clears throat> and apparently I can't replace it because it's discontinued. <laughs> Having a great recorder makes a lot of difference. They have a higher, higher quality preamps and a lower noise floor, allowing you to bring up your levels and posts. <clears throat> I know we talked about this before, but let me just have a real conversation with you guys. Um, you know, how many of you guys have bought new cameras within the last two years? How much money are we spending on cameras? Like, wh wh why is it that we spend thousands of dollars in new cameras, but when someone tells us we need, like, a, an audio recorder that's a few hundred dollars, we're like, whoa, wait, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of money. <laughs> you know, we, 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 most of us invest ten times amount of money into video than we do audio, and that's a very conservative figure, because reality is when you consider, like, anything from drones and gimbals <laughs> and, you know, um, any lenses, when you factor in all that stuff, audio is probably getting 1 20th or 1 30th of the total tech budget. But good audio will make your, will boost your films so much. Um, it, it, the percentage that it boosts your films comparatively to how much you spend on video is, is so much higher. Buy good equipment. You know, the, the Zoom F4 was like 400 bucks, 450 bucks. Those new recorders, the Zoom F6, the, uh, the, the sound devices one that both have the 32-bit floating point process, uh, whatever, I don't know the terms, mm. but that are be, everyone's talking about in forums and stuff like that, they will give you the cleanest audio you've ever had, and w w you can like literally un unpeak it at post. If it's peaking in a recording, you can dial it back, and it's not peaking anymore. It's like audio magic, and we have it available to us at a, a fraction of the cost that we spend on video cameras. So guys, invest in good audio. Your films will... It's, no, it's actually no coincidence. We started, um, we started bringing our own mic at the end of 2016. And at the time we started bringing our own mic, we were charging around $3,500 for wedding films. After, I mean, there's other factors that go into this as well, but after bringing our own mic, we've like tripled our pricing in the last couple of years. And it started with things like having a good microphone and getting the highest quality of audio possible. It's one of those factors that people will not ever write down or say, man, listen to this audio. But it's one of those underlying factors that is one of those unspoken things that affects people's uh, decisions about hiring you or about spending more money that is it's not, not really quantifiable. Because they, they tell us there's just something about your films that we really like. We're not even sure what it is. And that could be a lot of different elements, but we definitely think a big part of that is audio, too. It's obviously the so. drone shots. <laughs> With any questions or? Um, we talked about better audio um, mics and all that. What would you say about being better uh, lapel mics beyond what's on the comes to the gear? Absolutely. Because I've heard, I've seen like some YouTube like comparison videos, and I guess the problem is like I can't really hear the difference, but is there a difference when you start editing it with like the noise floor? I would, I would say, well, <clears throat> the noise floor is more about the recorder. But, I mean, it's going to be impacted a little bit about the strength of the signal coming off the lav. I mean, if you're using a lav that you got from Walmart, it's probably not going to sound too good. Anything that we would buy is probably going to, it's going to have the same type of noise floor capabilities. It's more about just the quality. It's about the full body. You know, I used this lav for the first time uh, for a love story film I did in May. 
And I, I, you know, at the time, I knew better loves were out there, and, I, and I, didn't just, I just didn't know how much of a difference it would make. So when I did this love story in May, I flew up to DC, and I brought my full boom kit, you know, boomed them for the interview. And I did the love and the boom pole, and I almost couldn't tell the difference. And this, this lavalier is the Sennheiser Mickey 2 MKE2. Uh, the normal lavalier that I'd been using prior to this was the ME2. And they're both omnidirectional microphones, but the full bodiness that comes out of these lavaliers is so robust, it actually, it almost sounds like a handheld. And if you were to place this, place this next to a handheld, you'd, you'd falter for a second figuring out which is which. So investing in good lavs really does bring up the quality of your stuff. Not the noise floor, but just the full bodiness. Because when you're comparing a cheap lav with a good full bodied lav, it's a night and day difference. A cheap lav doesn't sound that much different than like an on camera shotgun microphone. Mm -hmm. Is that the lav that you're putting into your. This one? Or the, 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 the expensive lav you're investing in. Or is, uh, I mean, for like during the, during the ceremony? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at first we only had the one, and um, there was visually I could tell the difference between them, and I would use it on the efficient because most of the words that were coming from the efficient, but we knew we were being held back because only half of our audio was being acquired really well. So I actually bought a second one of these just, uh, just for this conference, and now going forward, now we have two really good lobs, and um, yeah. Just and I have to say, I don't even think I've told you this, but since getting the better mic, I do a lot less audio post-production. It already sounds good. So I used, I mean, I always do a compressor, and then normally I have to do an EQ, but I almost feel like it doesn't even need to be EQ'd. So it saves on post-production. <clears throat> One more thought on, audio, on this subject, and this, this also goes with drones, it goes with video. A lot of you talk about separating yourself from your competition. You know, there's 50 people that go for a $1,500 wedding. You know, you can talk, uh, the, the, some of the different, the, Easiest thing that you can do to separate yourself from your competition is sometimes with better equipment. You know, you don't necessarily have to buy the most expensive cameras and lenses, but even just buying a nice microphone, sorry, I just tap it. <laughs> even just buying a, a really nice microphone and having really good audio can be the difference that, you know, people are like, well, I like this film better. You know, it, it just has something to it that, I, that the other films don't have. There are small things that you can do with gear-wise to separate yourselves out from your competition to distinguish yourself. And like I said, most of us are spending 10 to 20 times the amount on video than we do audio. And audio is just a, such a simple thing. I mean, come, come on, they're, they're watching on their phone. You know, most of the time, it, 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 you could shoot it with an 8K Monstro, and it looks the same on the phone as it does most other cameras. <laughs> but the audio will still sound better if you, do, if you have better equipment. The Sennheiser, well, the, the DR10s, they come with um, a Tascam microphone. They kind of, I mean, they're adequate Is for- Is about the microphone or the recorder? He's talking about the microphone that comes oh. with that oh. kit. Okay. It's, think about it this way. The recorder costs about 200 bucks. How much does the kit cost? Like 200 bucks. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it's an, a very adequate microphone that gets the job done but you essentially paid nothing for it. It's kind of like a kit lens. You know. I was using Sennheiser ME2s over the Tascam microphones that came with these, um, which were a huge step up. The Sennheiser microphones were like 130 bucks. Um, and so the Mickey 2 microphones, we got as a, in a pack with a G4. I feel like I'm flashing the camera. <laughs> oh, oops, sorry. Ca came with uh, these packs. So it was a bundle deal, so it came a little cheaper, but you can buy them for like 350 bucks. But there's, there's a lot of great microphones out there. I love how I could be teaching and I could see that someone's at my front door. <laughs> but uh, th there's a lot of great microphones out there. You've got the Sennheiser Mickey Twos, you've got the uh, Trams, you've got the Countrymen's. Um, there's a lot of great microphones in the market for that three to $400 range. I just happened to pick this one up with this kit and fell in love with it. And I'm like, wow, this is all I need because it pairs so well with my boom microphone. Any, anything else regarding the audio or? All right. 
You have to point it at the computer, John, not the TV, right? That's why it's not working. No, it's it's RF. Okay. It just keeps going into sleep mode. Lighting the okay, lighting the toast giver and toast receiver is key for good visual cinematics. Um, this is okay. This is kind of um, probably more in the wrong section. We're going to talk more about this with the next section, which is just going to be more about the cinema of the day. But just I threw it in here because when thinking about the toast. We, you need good visuals to go with the story. So when the people are giving the toasts and they're, they're saying their clips, you need the good visuals because you have to show the toaster. So this is just a reminder that lighting the toaster is going to be all the difference with a good shot and a bad shot. We will talk more about lighting um, this stuff in the next section. Different elements can make for a successful narrative. Um, okay, post-production coming later. Practical advice. Be prepared to lavalier the speaker in case the speaker's microphone starts giving interference. Not all weddings, I'm able to bring my own mic, so having a lava ready is essential for moments where things start going wrong. True story. There was this um, Indian wedding I did a couple of years ago, right? And um, he had the mic EQ'd in a way. So, I mean, he literally was eating the mic, and, and every time someone talked into the microphone, and it was just the entire, every, all the toast was like that. And I turned to Kay, and I'm like, we need to do something about this. And I try, I try to talk to the, D, the DJ about, you know, bringing these levels down or about bringing my own mic. And the DJ's assistant in, intercepted me. I, I was not prepared for this. The <laughs> DJ's assistant intercepted me and said, bro, this DJ just had a heart attack two months ago. Please do not burden him with anything right now. And I'm like, OK, I've got so many questions here. <laughs> Why, you know, if you just had a heart attack two months ago, you should not be working, and you really need to rethink your life's decision and vocation if being a DJ is so stressful that it gave you a heart attack at like 35 years old. And so I'm just like, I didn't know what to do, because I'm like, OK, I, I need good that. audio, but I'm not going to be responsible for the DJ being laid out in the middle of the reception. <laughs> So I go to Kay and I said, Kay, we have a problem here. And like, the only way we are going to get good audio is if we individually mic all the toasters with a, with a body pack. And there's probably been about three or four weddings over the last two or three years where we've had, we've had I've told Kay and I said, look, I, ha I don't have confidence that we're going to get good audio. We need to be proactive, micing them up, and I'll still get my recording that I normally get, but I don't have confidence that the audio is going to be good. And in most of those cases, it's actually worked out because there was one time where like, I heard the, the audio, the, the, the uh, RF dropping in and out, or maybe they had the, the, like a really strong kind of like, I don't know the proper term for it, but some sort of a gate on it in which every, everything that the person was saying was being cut off. Either way, practical advice, being prepared. You know, when you're at Toast, have some body packs with you. You know, because you might just need to jump in, and that, and and this is all about we talked about in the first section with the confidence, with about you know uh, stepping in, controlling the situation, and getting the results that you want. Because you can't be timid and do this job and get good results. Mm -hmm. You have to identify that there's a problem, and with minimal interference, you have to step in and correct it. Um, what does that look like? I mean, you're, you're figuring out as they're giving the toast. I'm figuring out beforehand, or worst case scenario, the first person goes up and I'm realizing there's a problem, and so I'll, I'll jump in with the second person and start micing them individually. Being at the ready to, to figure out when, you know, being, it, this is part of like, sometimes you can be proactive. Proactive means during, during the tests, I heard that there were problems, so I knew I was going to have to do something different. Being reactive listening to what you're hearing and realizing that this is probably not going to give you good results, so you need to kind of step in and during alter the actual, during the actual yeah. event and, that, and to get better results. So we won't interrupt the toast that's happening. That one's just dead to us, and we won't be able to use it. And we'll just try to save the rest of them. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I had one a few days ago that just saved my life because the DJ's audio was not really good, but I took my 10L and did a
I know a lot of people who tape the mic to the stand and have, have good results. And look. That's a lot faster than having to mic individual It's people. a lot faster. Yeah. Personally, we've never done that. We always try to mic the individual person. But it's, it's a great alternative, and it's a great example of doing something that's going to give you better results than doing nothing. Being productive. Mm -hmm. And I'm much more advocate of that than putting a lavalier in front of the speaker. Guys, I am such a, I do not like that whole trend of just draping a lavalier over a speaker. I mean, there's no way that it's that gives. It's only part of the sound frequency, right? It's part of the sound. That's the least of it. But I mean, those tiny mics are not designed for like a loud PA driving directly into their microphones. I mean, at best, it's going to sound not great. At worst, it's going to blow the little um, coils inside of that microphone because it's just not designed for that loud of a sound. There's just better ways to do it. Um, if you do it and get good results, I, I trust me, there's a better way. But were there any other questions about? It's on to the draping. I, I, I always cringe when I see pictures of it, people talking about how, hey, look, I, I fixed my sound <laughs> situation. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they just take a shotgun, put it on a stand, and direct it towards one of the speakers in the ceiling. And I'm like, I went to it. Your couples are not going to be thinking about any of this before the wedding. It's up to you to advocate for this, advocate for some of the elements to be included in their wedding day. Most of my pre-wedding dialogue is about getting good audio. They're not thinking about any, they're not, you know, when they're booking their wedding, they're thinking about their, their dress, they're thinking about their honeymoon, all these other things. They're not thinking about writing each other letters. They're not thinking about how you're going to get good audio. You need to be, they, they hired you because you're supposed to be the one in charge of doing all that with excellence. So be your own advocate for this type of stuff. Step in, be the boss, and you know, get great audio. That's going to elevate your brand you know, so much um, with, with your wedding film creation. <clears throat> I actually turn off anything making a hum like AC or even refrigerators during the reading of letters. I mentioned this before. I'm really bad. I walk up to whatever and just start turning stuff off. <laughs> Most of the time, I forget to turn it back on. I'm sorry. <laughs> if, it's, if it's where the bride and groom will be later on that night, I try to make sure to turn the AC back on. Just remember, most AC systems take about a minute to two minutes to turn off, or at least the fans. So in preparation, knowing that you're going to record audio, turn it off two minutes ahead of time. So that way, it's probably going to be off by the time you're ready for it. I unplug refrigerators. I always make sure to plug refrigerators back in. Unless it's like in a hotel, I don't really care. <laughs> I always just wonder like the, like the maids who are coming into the hotels after I deal with them because I'm like moving furniture around. I'm like literally just like moving everything around and I just can only imagine it looks like. The phones are on the floor, the lamps are on the floor. <laughs> yeah. it, it looks like a, like a really weird scene. And I, <laughs> I know that you know, at some point they come in and are just kind of like looking at it like, what the heck happened here? Do you typically try to put stuff back not if it's a hotel. I mean, <laughs> if it sometimes was somebody's just, house, we would. <laughs> someone's house, sure. If the bride and groom are going to be back there later, I'll try. They sometimes still have staff to clean it up. Sometimes I ask the groom, I'm like, hey, do you mind if we leave it like this? He's like, I don't care. And the staff will clean it up. You know, it's not like I'm like just tossing stuff in a big pile. I'm just rearranging and, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes, you know, when you need good light in a hotel, like, so, I mean, we've all been there. We're in a hotel room. And you need good light, and you, you want to go close to the window. But close to the window is this big glass top thing with a big lamp on it. I'm unplugging a lamp, moving the whole thing to the other side of the room. I'm moving chairs. I'm just moving whatever is in my way of getting the, the groom in a good light and to, for myself to be in a good position where I can get that good shot. Fight for elements to be included in many weddings. We do getting the letter reading is a fight. I mean, we talked about this before. I don't like um, the word fight. Fight for time, I fight for everyone to be quiet, I kick everyone out. I fight for the photographer to not shoot any photos during the reading out loud portion. If the planner tells you it's being moved to later in the day, it absolutely will not happen. That's experience talking. I was told I can't use the word fight anymore. Um, <laughs> to conflict, um, I literally kick everyone out of the room when they're reading the letter out loud. You know, if there's groomsmen, I don't care how much they say they're gonna be quiet, they won't. So I just say, guys, outside, very politely, and say, guys, would you mind stepping outside for just two minutes? We're, we're going to read this letter. And it's the only way to make sure that you're getting what you need. Um, are you going to like, talk about all, like, working with, like, tips for working with photographers? 
Yes, that's a section. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, it's not on the schedule. We so added it. So just, just a reminder, this is all about getting good story. And I, I'm, uh, okay, 450, we're not doing too bad. I originally said I was going to be 6 o'clock. Then outside the door, it said 5. Totally understand if you guys, um, does anyone need to leave at 5? The next section is going to be about the cinematic part of the day. The next section is the last section we have for the day. I uh, so just wanted to kind of let you all know where we were. Hey, can, can um, I do the PowerPoint of the images? It'll give them some visual. Sure, pull it up That'd while, be good we, right while now. if anyone has any questions about the story part of the day. Audio, acquiring audio. Again, get good audio equipment. It will make the difference in your films. Acquiring good audio. The Tascam DR10s. I have a love-hate relationship with the Tascam DR10s. They're great units, but they're poorly built. My, my, I, I, I've lost audio from the Tascam DR10s in the past just because they're, they're very cheap. They're plastic. There technically is a better unit out there called, uh, there's Electrosonic uh, portable recorder that is made, I mean, they use it in movie productions. Those things are built like tanks and they will not fail on you, but they're like $1,200 each. So I haven't quite invested in those yet, but maybe, maybe soon. Zoom makes a similar product to the DR10 now. Yeah, so it's chunky though. Yeah, the Zoom, Zoom makes one, but it, it's chunky. DR10s are great because they don't really visibly poof out, and they have a belt clip, which is also mm. really nice, especially when you're trying to get around weird objects. Or put it on a dress. Katie, you want to talk about this? Yeah, so over the past um, maybe six months or so, I decided I wanted to start taking, or I'm totally walking out of camera, let's see. I wanted, uh, started taking iPhone photos of certain situations, you know, because I knew we were going to be doing education, and I wanted to show what it looks like behind the scenes. And so this is a rehearsal dinner, and so we have our cameras. The rule is, you know, have you guys heard of the 180 rule? Yeah, so you want the cameras on the same side. If there's, if there's a line between the toaster and the bride and groom, you want your cameras on the same side, and that'll result in, them, in being where it looks like they're talking to each other. Um, but this is a rehearsal, rehearsal dinner. We're using 70 to 200s. That's our mic stand. Um, and then we have two torch LEDs lighting the scene. So you have the, you have the lights on the opposite sides of the camera. Yes, so we want dimensional lighting. We never want the light on the same side as, uh, as the camera. Because otherwise it'll just be a flat light. There will be no shadow here. <clears throat> and that is a huge tip for cinematic shooting. For lighting. Which we're going to get into more in the next section. Uh, just a little, bit, a little bit of a hack. Um, so a lot of times you have two lights and you have two subjects. The trick is with lighting, if you can, if you can get it to work, you, uh, for each light is going to be the front light for one person and the back light for the other person. So there's a way to crisscross your lights that... that um, it couldn't work in this situation. If we had more space behind him, oh, we didn't have any space. Behind we could have him. put this light further, and he would have had a hair light, and it would have lit the bride and groom. So, so. Th that's why uh, w uh, most of the times what we're trying to do is we're trying to utilize two lights to light two people, which means that, and again, because to get dimensional lighting, you want a front light and a hair light, and you want it to always be off axis because it, you don't want it to look flat. Yeah. Are you two torches together, or there's one? There's one here and one here. Um, and they're on, are they on cheetah stands? I think we have cheetah stands where you can just like pick it up and the legs close. Um, this is super portable. So for rehearsal dinners, we don't mess with the Ditos. Usually rehearsal dinners are really compact and uh, we try to c create a smaller set. So we'll use the, the LEDs for toasts for rehearsal dinners. You know what? So what I do, we used to have a third camera for that, but what I started doing is we don't need to roll on them the entire time. I'll start like moving around and scanning the audience. If I have like three or four good reaction shots, then I'll just go back to them. And I'm good for the highlight. I don't need reaction shots all through the doc edit, which I used to do and realized it was a waste of time. Mm. Yeah. What about the lighting on those people? I look for people in good light. Yeah. Um, it's a lot easier to do. This is at, outside at night. I don't remember specifically if I got reaction shots here, but at a wedding, I'm looking for people in good light. So. Um, so I just, yeah, I wanted you guys to see some things, and then I posted this on the, the group the other day. I don't know how many of you guys saw this, um, but the scene did not look particularly special. Uh, I had a moment with her. Her bridesmaids were getting dressed. Her mom was getting dressed. It's that moment 
that I would keep talking about. And she was doing absolutely nothing. And they had written custom vows, and I really wanted, honestly, what inspired me was her robe. I just loved this long, lacy robe. And because um, I didn't even, I wasn't even planning on doing a writing shot. Um, and so all I did was I brought this table out. On this table was a pen. They had paper too, but she already had her own paper. You can see the lamp is gone, the phone so is yeah, gone. Yeah, so I just put the lamp on the floor. It's just, it's just right behind her. Put the phone on the floor, brought the table out, moved these, this was the flowers. They were wrapped in horrible green tissue paper for some reason. But I just moved that box. Actually, the planner helped me move that, up, move that out of the way. Um, and I just, you know, because this is beautiful light. We look for window light. Um, so, yeah, I was really pleased with that shot. And this took less than five minutes, the whole thing, moving the set, setting her down. And she was excited to do it. She saw the vision. I was excited. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this would be so pretty. If we have time, let's do it. And she's like, okay. So she went and got her stuff, and she was excited to do it. Can I make a mention, guys? I don't know of a single videographer who is successful as a photojournalistic videographer. There's a lot of photographers who are very successful as photojournalistic. And if you don't know the term photojournalistic, true photojournalism means that you do not interfere with, the, with what the scene. You're, you're a complete outsider looking in. That means whatever it's like you're getting. It's like a newspaper getting, journalist. What was like that? A, it's like a newspaper photographer. Well, like, it's specifically, it, kind of, or um, just it, the, the philosophy in it is that you do not modify or manipulate anything going on. Uh, everything is 100% happening in real life. Meaning that, you know, if I'm filming Sarah and that Deer Park water bottle is in front of her, <laughs> that's part of the scene. You know, there are, there are a lot of photographers who make a name for themselves by being photojournalistic. It was, it's a very popular, or it was popular. Some couples really want it. Some couples really mm -hmm. love it because that's when you get the real authentic moments. Photojournalistic photographers not are great at it's that. It's not curated. It's just as is. I don't know of a single, single cinematographer who's successful as a photojournalistic not changing anything. I, I would say it's our job to kind of create the scene that we want to, but, but it's creating the scene with minimalist intervention because you don't want to upheave the entire day and make everyone kind of cave to you to kind of change everything. It's like, you know, if this is a wedding going on, I'm like, all right, everyone move to this side of the room. We're just going to clear everything out of the way. You're, you're finding minimalist things to do that is going to create a scene that feels like it's part of a movie. And so I got like four or five different angles. You know, I got real wide, I got close, I just got her hand, I panned down from her face down to her hand. So I got several shots to sequence together. Uh, but again, it was all very quick. Um, so I'll go to the next thing. So this is what the room actually looked like. It was a mess, it was crowded. Um, I might have moved, I might have already moved a couple things off her, off this little desk here. And then when it, it was time for her letter reading, none of this changed. It still looked like a mess. But this is what I'm getting in my frame. And it's all about the lighting. Like, these, these shots would not be magical without the light on her face. Now, the other shot on the bottom right, was that right out of the camera, or did you have to do any more? That was right out of the camera, okay. yeah. Is it the 100 2.8? Um, I think I was in a tight space. I think I was probably, I think I was literally sitting, like, right here on the 50. Wow. So I was really close to her for that shot. So that just created natural bokeh. So um, this I also posted in the group. Uh, so these two here, she's in uh, just regular lighting of the. Did the photographer put them there or the planner? She just started getting dressed. OK, what it was, um, we couldn't put her in good light because she was getting undressed. And so and there, she was like. There's a door people could see, so we didn't want her to put, we didn't want her to be exposed with an open door. Once she got decent, then I asked her to come over to the open door, and we get the cinematic lighting here. So I'm just showing the difference of this is me just increasing my ISO. But this, this, I mean, this looks good. I mean, a lot of us who get this and feel good about this, a lot of us will see this in films and say, hey. You know, it's properly composed. It's good lighting, but it, it's all that mentality of shifting yourself to think about. How can we make it better? We just want that directional lighting. Just be really intentional. And I feel like it looks, oh good, it looks better in front. It looks really blown out from the side. Oh, you know it does. <laughs> okay, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from the side, it looks like it's like five stops overexposed. And I'm, the one, and I'm the one that placed her there. I'm the one that said, hey, let's come up to the door. That looks amazing. Everybody come up front. And they just finished getting her ready at, by the door. Yeah? So the light's coming from the left side, and you speak more to the right side, so the light's coming opposite. 
access was like yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is the wall, and the, there's a door here. And I told her to look out the door. Oh, something that. So it's leaving weird tracing marks in the screen. Uh, we're going to have to return the TV. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I tell them to look towards the light. Yeah, and uh, if I was shooting where the door was, then it would just be flat lighting. So I'm definitely trying to be basically at a right angle of the light source, or uh, a little bit less. If you've studied lighting, you know that there's a key light and a, and a fill light. And, you know, typical lighting, what we say is a three-point lighting. I would say a lot of the lighting we do is kind of like two point. We're always looking for that third, but it, it might sound a lot counterintuitive that the the the, pri the key light is actually going to be on the far side of the person, not what you would think. You would almost think the key light would be near, but we're putting the we're putting the key light on the far side of the person, and the fill light is coming on the other side. So what that does is, I mean, because if the key light was on this side, we wouldn't all we would see is kind of like a flat. This is what happens when the key light is kind of like with you. You just get a very flat image. So by putting the key light on the far side with the fill light, um, and the fill is just kind of ambient light in this picture, key light being the window that, that's coming out of this, that's what's creating that dimension. And it's, it's simple tips like that of just kind of like having that directional light, um, light that kind of contours around the face uh, that, that can really up your game with your cinema. Yeah, so even when we're in bridal suites that have no windows, I'll go ahead and get these shots because I'm like, I need the shots of her getting ready if I can't get the more cinematic stuff. So I'll still get something like this, but then usually um, even the photographer wants to help do this. Uh, once she's ready or decent, we're like, okay, let's go outside, let's find a window, let's do something else, and then we'll kind of restage some stuff with lighting like this. A lot of times we are in rooms without good lighting and we'll just take her somewhere else. But this was all. This was all in the same place. What is the ISO that you use for interior? The ISO? Oh, I have no idea. I don't stay on one ISO. Um, well, when we're um, when we're shooting, I mean, we have to be thinking like a DP in some regards, a director of photography. Where you know, what we what we're traditionally doing is we're setting like the shutter. Then we're setting the ISO. Then we're setting the. Well, I think then about the setting, aperture first. I'm sorry, aperture. Yeah, for depth. Aperture, shutter. Then uh, ISO for us is generally the last thing we set. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's forever we, it needs to be for the shutter and the aperture. Our general rule is uh, this dates back to when we had the Canon 60D cameras. Is we don't we generally don't go much above 1600. N nowadays, you know, we can easily go to 3200. And um, you know, not really notice any visual visible grain, but we know that cameras these days can go much higher than that. Mm -hmm. You know, I can push that one DX to like 6400 ISO, still looks pretty good. But that, but that means it's going to look really flat. Well, we're just getting to that. And I know you, so many people out there, love to talk about how you can get like 100,000 ISO. You know, you can shoot in pure black darkness and still get an image. But the thing is, we want you to think like a cinematographer. A cinematographer is thinking to himself, you know, because a doc, if you're just thinking like a documentary videographer, you're thinking to yourself, it just needs to be lit. We need to be able to see what's happening. If you start thinking like a cinematographer, you're thinking to yourself, not just how do I get this, but how do I make it look good? And any time you're boosting the ISO that much, you're, you're not going to have enough uh, light contouring to make the subject stand out, and the entire image is just going to look flat. I, I would say that there's some exceptions to when you would need to do that just to kind of cover something as, from a documentary perspective to make sure you get it. Like for example, if there's a, if there's a real big moment happening on the dance floor and your lights are off, and, and like maybe they're doing a sorority song and you need to just cover something just because you need to cover it. Mm. You know, it's still a wedding, it's still an event. You, you can't come in 100% cinematography and think that I'm not gonna cover it because I don't have my lights set up. To, you know, pump your ISO up just to get that event. It probably won't go in a creative edit. Um, but if they ask for it, we have it. But if they so ask for it, they have it. And you know, even if it did somehow end up in a creative edit, you show one quick shot and then you have the audio. But that, that's kind of like the whole idea about thinking like a cinematographer and thinking like, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And you want, you want the lighting to look good. You don't want it to just look passable. Um, what about the shutter? Do you have a, a threshold? So we kind of break rules. We just do what looks good, honestly. Um, we try to adhere to the 180 rule in shutters, being that you know you don't you don't want to um, 
you want to be at twice shutter as your frame rate. But then, you know, it's like once we get outside into the Georgia sun, you know, we're juicing that thing to like 4,000. And uh, yeah, we would increase the shutter before the aperture to close out light. So, no NDs. No it was NDs. time for NDs. I mean, it's unless you have like yeah, a C100, some of those Canon cinema cameras have built in NDs. Um, yeah. Ryan, you can, you can pump that in real quick. NDs are better because, you know, when you start doing uh, shutter, you actually reduce your color when you, when you put your shutter too high. NDs will make it so that your color is preserved when, when, uh, so that way you're not losing too much color. But, I mean, here, here's all the, the clients of mine who've ever <laughs> complained because I put my shutter to 4,000. That's too high. <laughs> Zero. 4,000? I get a 4,000 all the really? time. That's bad. Come on, right? <laughs> you do it too, you just don't realize Not 4, it. 4,000. I would start increasing my aperture, I think, if I had to go that high. 4,000. <laughs> here's how many times my editor has complained <laughs> that I've gone to 4,000 shutter. I think I've gone to 6. Oh, but. Um, I've had several cases uh, as far as in, for lighting and stuff um, where the bride's getting ready inside of a, a place that has, you know, the bride, she's getting ready the bride suite of mm -hmm. the venue or whatever, and there's no windows. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, even, uh, there's this one specific venue I'm thinking of in, where they have hand lights, and so I've tried bringing in um, torch lights a lot of times. It's better than like it's better than like hand lights and stuff, mm -hmm, totally. but it's so harsh and stuff. And so yeah. I'm trying to figure out like a better way. Is there better ways to like light them when you don't have that natural source? Yeah. Or just take them somewhere else. Or? So in a situation like that, uh, with my torch, I would turn off the can lights. Absolutely. Um, what's really great with the torch is you can bounce it off the ceiling, bounce it off a white wall, and suddenly have this really nice soft light. So I went and pointed it directly at the bride. We did that one time at like when we were filming at like 7 o'clock in the morning. There was no light the sun coming wasn't in even the up. <laughs> and we, we started at like 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. And bouncing it off the ceiling actually created a nice soft glow in the yeah, entire room. Yeah, so I would do that. Um, but then I would still try to take her to... Um, if we can just exit that room, wherever the first window is, wherever the first door is, and just try to re like stage some stuff over there to get that directional, nice cinematic lighting. Mm -hmm. So to get the clean uh, shot, do you recommend us to uh, paint it right through the window so, so we can get a good shot through that? Um, yeah. Do you recommend it, or if, if they want to do it, if they want to shoot from this one other side, like let's say, sometimes they want to do, uh, are you talking about for like the makeup and hair? Yes. Yeah, we, we definitely advocate to the bride uh, or to the, make, to the person applying the makeup to move to better lighting. Sometimes they vehemently de refuse. If they're middle of everything and they're not going to move everything, I have asked before and I said, I'll help you move stuff and she, I, they have moved stuff for me. Um, but honestly, if they are in bad light, they're interested in getting in good light too uh, because they need to be able to see what they're doing. Um, if they're in bad light, we'll also put up our torch LEDs and create that light for the or makeup Or sometimes too. you can ask the, hair, the, uh, the makeup person to just <laughs> apply some finishing touches. Just have them move to the light, just do a couple things. Yeah, after, she's, after they're done, after we can stage, done. Some, st stage some stuff. I remember I asked one of the ladies to make up, you know, she and I, because I'm moving to the window. So, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I tried to get, you know, reach out, and then I was, I was telling her that I was going to tag it, tag it in, you know, so they can see her work. Yeah. So that's yeah, something to. Okay. So, but anytime you have to raise your um, ISO to get more light, this is still all going to be flat lighting. If you don't have a light source, whether it's a window or your torch light, um, it's going to be flat. Right. Did I say that? Right. Okay. It's just. If, you, if you're looking to, like, if you're at a price point and you're wanting to get to a different price point, if you're wanting to elevate the quality of your films, you have to, uh, you have to get into a position where the majority of the weddings that you're doing, you're able to get, the, uh, to get what you need, meaning that you're able to get the bride into the good light. You know, maybe once in a while you can't, and that's, that's the exception, not the rule, but the rule is you need to be fighting, sorry, <laughs> I'm not allowed to say fighting. Advocating? You need, you need to be strongly <laughs> advocating 
to get the bride into the good light because that's what's gonna make your film look good. And you're more concerned about the film looking good than you are about maybe creating a piece. But, but there's, there's a tactful way to do it. You know, you don't, you don't just tell the makeup person, hey, you're wrong. You just say, hey, look, um, I, just need to get some, I just need to get some shots. Would you mind if you just applied some, fin if we moved over here, I just need for like five seconds, we just need some finishing touches. Or if you get it early enough in when they're just starting and saying, hey, would you mind if we move closer to uh, the window just because it's gonna look better. And, and the thing is, if you start saying things like look better, A, the bride is gonna wanna She's look better. Yeah. She's interested. And even a makeup person is gonna be interested in getting the best representation of her clients that she's gonna wanna use because not only is it gonna make the video look better, it's also gonna make the photography look better. Yeah, that's true. Um, so this was a super challenging ceremony. Um, this is the <laughs> second time that this has happened to us in like a year or two where we have just a beam of light blasting out somebody at the ceremony. This is not what it looked like in the viewfinder, by the way. In the viewfinder, like the entire frame was dark except for the efficient head. Okay, yeah, so we had to make a choice. Do we want a fireball? here and they're exposed or since he's talking because we use his narrative he needs to be exposed and these they were pitch black i brought them up in post <clears throat> and that's something i thought about while i was filming i'm like you know what i'm going to black them out i need to get him perfect this is what i'm concerned about here because i don't want anything blowing out in our shot especially if it's people if it's their skin you don't want them blowing out so we had to make the decision of making everything really dark and this too man i should have showed you guys before i lightened it this is like so dark, but this was during their vows, I think. You created um, a mask for that, didn't you? So I actually did do a mask here um, where <coughs> I kind of cut him out. Honestly, you might be able to see it a little bit. Actually, well, that's the window. So I did a little bit of a mask, and I kept him exposed how I had it in camera, and then I lit up, you know, I layered another same clip, whatever, on top of it, and I lit up the rest of it. And that was John's idea because I felt weird that they were pitch black and you couldn't see the bride and groom. Um, so I did that in post. But Does anyone film light and airy? Is there anyone here that has that type of style? I have some photographers like that, but I mean, I can't. Like, I haven't I seen it. The only person that I know that films like that is like Caleb Gordon Lee, which he did uh, in Jonathan Lane. But I mean, it's like film light, really pastel y. Like, okay. I don't know many videographers who do that. Well, then maybe his camera has really good dynamic range. Yes, that's what it is. So uh, those of us who are shooting on a DSLR, we have limited dynamic range. So when we're looking at our stuff and comparing it to Hollywood, we cannot compare with Hollywood because their cameras can expose the sky and the shadows at the Especially same time. Especially when you're shooting in like those raw formats that they have available in Hollywood. Yeah. They can do so much post work, it's ridiculous. So for, you know, we're shooting on DSLR, and in order <clears> to look <throat> cinematic, we don't want things blown out because you don't see Hollywood movies being blown out. But that means we have to choose to really crush the shadows in order to make the highlights exposed. So you have to kind of like make that decision. We're not even on the cinematography topic. That's next. And somehow <laughs> well, I feel we, like we, this we, was like a good segue. It was into a good segue. It. But one of the one of the things to just kind of want to put in, um, give you guys food to think about is that you know, when you think about who are the high end videographers that you think about, think about who are the high end videographers for the style you're going for. For us, you know, the people we followed. Um, I don't know a single high-end person who's doing really great work who's blowing out their highlights. And one of the biggest things that I see with, with other people's films, especially people at the price point of like $1,500, $2,000, $2,500, is blown highlights. One of the easiest things that you can do to your films to really bring you from here to here is exposing for the highlights. And uh, by exposing for the highlights, what we're talking about is, um, I might not give the perfect explanation, but w w when you're seeing the brightest thing in your frame, you're exposing for that, not, um, not, not necessarily even the subject. Now that's the rule, not the exception. Sometimes, you know, it's like, sometimes, you know, that one shot where she was writing a letter, technically that window was blown out in the background. But generally speaking, like when we're filming outside, we want to see the texture of the sky. When we're filming like indoors and there's a, a really bright light happening, that whatever that bright light is touching, we expose for that. And if, even if that means everything else looks a little dark, that's the way we shoot. And then in post, we'll bring up those dark a little bit. But if you're, if you're overexposing your shots and you try to bring down the exposure in post, you've lost all of your detail. And you're not going to get any of that detail back.
higher end videographers save the highlight information. They, they, they don't blow stuff out. It's just a simple way for you guys to really elevate the level of your films. I mean, unless it's a look and feel that, you ha that you're successful with, creatively you love it and your clients love it, but if you're looking for uh, style decisions and direction, try not to blow out your highlights. Do you have any practical advice for that? I'm not how to blow it out. I'm oh, you just sure. don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we might cover it. Anyway, we so. might, we'll cover it a little bit more later. No, I, we, we use, we, I mean, you saw how many lenses we have. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't leave a polarizer and everything <laughs> we could, but the biggest thing we're interested in is, especially if it's outside and we have the bride's dress, we need to make sure we see the detail in her dress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, the dress is the number one thing that will be blown out in every single one of your shots. And, you know, you want to preserve that detail. And that, that, that'll easily make your stuff look higher end if you're, if you're not blowing out your highlights. And you can do a lot more bringing up the low lights in post than you probably think you can. Um, but it's just when you try to bring down those highlights, it, it's, just, it's just a mind, you know, maybe, maybe some people have their, their LCD screens set for like really dark and they don't realize they're blowing it out. But start looking through your film, start looking at how much the, the highlights you are. It's, it's something that we, we advocate strongly for, just making sure your, your highlights are exposed properly. And, and again, it, and, and even from, unless it's a creative decision, if you're just talking about elevating your brand, getting your films to look better, just about all the people I know who are high end all have properly exposed highlights. Mm -hmm. You just kind of want to throw well, that in there. What's the compromise when you have a mix um, skin complexions? Same, I mean, we uh, just. The different skin complexions, like, you're talking you're talking about because uh, you have to blow out the dress to get the skin tone right is that what you're right, asking we preserve the dress then she's like a silhouette yes. or something we preserve the dress it'll look better in yeah. post lcd screen we can your bring camera. up the, the darks and the okay. mid-tones in post your, your your lcd screen is probably lying to you that's the first problem it doesn't have as much contrast as is actually baked into the image so there's actually a lot more information there than what looks. You just have to trust practice and trust knowing that the information is there. And then you can bring it up at least to the point where you can see the detail in the skin tones and it's, it's not gonna look as bad as you think in post. Definitely practice it, um, you know, bring it out on a, on, a, on a really bright day and start, you know, again, the number one trick is, you know, you're looking at details in the dress and you're looking at details in the sky. If you're not seeing details in the sky like clouds and like even a little bit of color, you're probably a little bit overexposed. Yeah. From, from and our standards. And it just standards. makes it prettier too. You wanna see a blue sky with white clouds. Like. And it's a little bit of a creative decision. I, I'm not saying that, that you have to do this. This is something that we do and we found a lot of success with, but we've also noticed a lot of the people, most of the people who are killing it in the industry, this is what they're doing. And so we're bringing it to you as practical advice for this is a way to, to really bring the quality of your films up. Did you have your hand raised? Do you have any, um, do you all have any kind of guidelines or anything that you're thinking about whenever you're making those tough choices? Like, I know you said in that one example you blew out the window, but like, for example, also in the ceremony, let's say that Shaq the light wasn't on the efficient, they were all totally dark, which you then... Yeah, well, if they're evenly lit, then there's no problem. Well, you're saying because if there's a bright light source? Um, I would still try not to blow out the back background because I can bring it up in post. We actually yeah. have a wedding like that, um, the Lake Yukoni wedding. Yeah, the we, specifically we exposed dark just so we didn't get rid of all the details in the background. So it was, it was at Lake Yukoni, Ritz at Lake Yukoni, and it was, underneath the, it was in the middle of the day, but the ceremony was under a tent. But then outside the tent in the background, <laughs> it was really easy to blow the heck out of that background scene, especially since the tent was so dark. So we I tried mean, to play a middle ground yeah. of preserving both ends of that. Uh, we, we, we definitely wanted, I mean, the background was it's still not gonna perfect. Be, it's still gonna be really bright, but it's, it's not like, when you overexpose something, it starts looking hazy. So we don't want that haze. So we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring it down enough. But also think to yourself, this isn't all about like, the, the, what does it feel like in person? And, and sometimes we have, sometimes we can kind of have the fault of trying to manipulate what it, what it felt like in real life to try to create something. You know, like if you're doing a candlelight ceremony, that's what it feels like in real life. I mean, it's going to be dark. You know, you're not necessarily trying to change that. You know, if, if it appears dark on camera, 
that it might not be a bad thing because that's how it was in real life. If you're shooting underneath a tent, it might be a little dark in there. You're not trying to boost uh, the, the exposure to kind of match what you would expect of it. You know, you, you also want to have the mentality of preserving what this scene felt like. 